The following message is by Pastor John Piper. More information from Desiring God is available at www.desiringgod.org. Let's pray. Oh, oh, Father, I pray that we mean what we say. I will suffer not to hide thee. Not, I ask, beside thee. There is a savage necessity in the Christian life to wage war against the hiddenness of your glory. Pluck out an eye, if you must, to get to heaven and see God. Cut off a hand, if you must, to wean yourself off lower pleasures and fix yourself on endless ones. And I pray that you would make warriors of us all. Make savages of us, if we must be, in order not to let television or food, or internet, or the praise of men hide thee. And I pray that you would use Augustine's life and thought to sharpen our sword. In Jesus' name I pray. We heard this morning that the unthinkable happened in 410 A.D., namely that uh, Alaric and the gods came against Rome and sacked it. St. Jerome was in Palestine at the time, and he said, if Rome can perish, what can be safe? Well, Rome didn't perish immediately. Sixty-six more years until the last emperor was dethroned by the Germans. And the shockwaves in that 410 event across the Mediterranean very quickly. Augustine was 55 years old. In the prime of his ministry, He would go on ministering the word for another 20 years in Hippo, just southwest uh, across the sea in present day Algeria for another 20 years. But it was shocking, though it wasn't the end yet. And as you heard this morning, it did unleash the city of God in which his own philosophy of history over against the possible demise of Rome was developed for about 20 years of writing. August 28, 430, he dies. And just as he's dying, 80,000 vandals, as they were called, were coming across the north of Africa, where they had invaded through Spain, and the city in which he was living and ministering was under siege. In other words, these times in which Augustine lived were tumultuous times and between the shifting of whole civilizations. In those last months, as he saw the vandals coming, he had heard that two other Catholic bishops had been tortured to death in other cities as they came, as the vandals came. And when his own elders counseled him with the words of Jesus, flee to another city. He said, let not one dream of holding our ship so cheaply that the sailors, let alone the captain, should desert her in a time of peril. But strangely, he died four months before the city was overrun and completely sacked by the Vandals, And I just want to insert a preliminary parenthetical exhortation to courage here. 
My friend John Enzer came from Boston to talk about pro-life issues uh, two weeks ago at our church, and he pointed out to me something I'd never noticed before, and I'll point it out to you. In Revelation 21, 8, in the list of things that will be cast into the lake of fire, the first sin on the list is cowardice. Take that home, brothers, and open your mouths. That's a parenthesis. I will not forsake this ship, but the Lord took him. He had been bishop in Hippo since 396. Five years before that, he had been appointed priest and elder and had preached so approximately 40 years now, he had been serving this one church in Hippo, shepherding God's little flock there and defending the faith, and had become known all over the empire in the Christian church anyway as a God-besotted, biblical, articulate, persuasive defender of the faith against Manichaeism and Donatism and Pelagianism. Those were the three big false teachings as he saw them in his day, and he wrote on all of them. He was an unbelievable controversialist for all the mysticism in him. We'll say more about that later on. Just before he died, he handed over the reins to Heraclius, his associate, because he was an old man now. He died when he was almost 75. And Heraclius picked up the administrative duties. And on the day when Heraclius was installed as co-adjutor bishop, there was a great ceremony. And Augustine took his seat in the cathedral, the throne where he sat to preach. He sat to preach for 40 years. The people stood and he sat. I think that would really settle some pastors down to take content seriously <laughs> instead of motion. Would be really hard for me. I'm glad that's not in the Bible. Heraclius stood in front of him to preach the sermon at this retirement of their beloved bishop. And overwhelmed with a sense of inadequacy, he said, the cricket chirps, the swan is silent. So if you wondered where the title came from, that's where it comes from. The cricket chirps, the swan is silent. If Heraclius had known what we now know about the next 16 centuries, he wouldn't have said that. Because the swan is not silent today. He never has been silent for 1600 years, and he was not silent. He had several more years to go when this man was installed and some of his great work was done right up to the end. The man's influence is simply incalculable, as you know. Adolf Harnack said that the greatest man the church has possessed between Paul and Luther is Augustine. Now, Harnack was German, he had to say Luther, but others have said things differently than that. For example, Christian History Magazine, without any qualification or hesitation, said, now this is written just a few years ago, after Jesus and Paul, Augustine of Hippo is the most influential figure in the history of Christianity. Benjamin Warfield said, argued in his writings on Augustine, that he entered both the church and the world as a revolutionary force 